a new high for American literature. Fuck the Pulitzer for overlooking a text of this genius. Space, the final frontier. These are the YouTube musings of Seagulls Gather, an ongoing mission to read science fiction, to seek out good books and bad ones, to boldly split infinitives that few men have split before. Hello Captain, welcome to The Bridge. Today I am reviewing Aftermath by no less than LeVar Burton, who you may have heard of. He was Lieutenant Commander Geordi LaForge on Star Trek The Next Generation, which explains why this novel has a promotional quote from none other than Whoopi Goldberg, whose advice on books I value as highly as her knowledge of European history. Aftermath was published in 1997, and the backstory includes a chronology of events leading to an American Civil War of 2015 to 2018. This includes America launching a permanent space station, the first black president being elected but assassinated before he could take office, and America erupting into that civil war, which is along race lines. The novel follows five principal characters. The first is Leon, who is currently homeless in an America that has mostly collapsed. He was a scientist and discovered that the shuttle launches to and from the space station were causing global warming, and his discovery effectively shut down NASA and led to even more rioting and then to attempts on his life, one of which claimed his wife and daughter. The second is Dr. Rene Reynolds, who has invented the world's greatest machine, the Neural Enhancer, a small headband that cures literally everything. So smart is Dr. Reynolds that she invites all manner of corporate interests to view the device, hoping that they will invest in it, even though it will put them all out of business. Which leads us to Dr. Randall Sinclair, one such corporate interest who, tired of the skin cancer caused by the hole in the ozone there, is having skin grafts from darker skinned people patched over his white skin. This procedure, while not completely uncommon, is extremely expensive and limited only to wealthy white people. Next we have Amy, a lone child, orphaned by an earthquake and struggling to survive. Last but not least, Jacob Firecloud, Native American, who is convinced the end of the world is coming and sets out to seek a vision, gets one, and then heads off to try and rescue Dr. Reynolds. This is because, shortly after her presentation, Reynolds was kidnapped by some of those corporate interests already mentioned, and her amazing machine doesn't just cure everything, it also grants its user telepathy. So she's calling for help, specifically from Leon, but Jacob and Amy here as well, and join the general land trek in her direction. The journey, as you can imagine, is fraught with, shall we say, encounters and some danger towards the end, when we find that people are kidnapping black people and harvesting their skin for Dr. Randall's skin grafting business. This leads to Leon attacking their base to try to rescue her, which he succeeds in doing naturally with a little help from all the other people who came together just at the right moment. As stories go, the initial jumping between the first three or four characters does leave you wondering what sort of book am I reading here? Is it going to be like a chase, a rescue, a drama, a thriller, action? But what it ends up being is a lot of travelling, which is something I have discussed in previous videos. If you're going to make your book a travelling book, then you have to understand that your travelling can be part of the second act, for example, but not your second act. In that your first act introduces a problem, your second has to be working towards solving it or attempting to solve it, failing and then doing what you need to come back and succeed in the third act. If an entire act is simply travelling from A to B, then it isn't much of an act at all. And that's the case here. By the time you get to the position where they're actually going to do something about the situation, you need to be fully cognizant of what the situation is. But the concept of the skinning industry starts in chapter 28 of 32, 20 or 30 pages from the end. In turn, it means that your third act is very short, which is again a balancing act because if you've ever watched a Stephen Summers movie, you can clearly see that too much of a third act is a bad thing as well. He doesn't get it right, but it isn't insufferable, even when it does rely on a horrible dialogue contrivance to pull the various travellers together. Burton seems to think that a concept contributes to the three-act structure, but it doesn't. For example, saying people in the future get lots of skin cancer because the sun is hotter, that's a concept. But to be part of a three-act structure, it has to be a bigger part of the resolution or the problem. The skin grafts are introduced, even though a hat would be more practical, but that concept isn't part of the story, which is about the neural enhancer, until Reynolds is kidnapped by Skinners at the end. 
But even then, that leads to a disastrous part of the finale, when, with his enemy chained up and about to be skinned in a fortified prison complex that he owns and runs, Sinclair brings the priceless machine that she needs and decides to put it somewhere random, knowing that she would escape from being chained to the wall and come for it, and then he can capture or kill her there. Just take a second to think about the sort of plan that involves having somebody captured and chained completely at your mercy and then looking at them and thinking they're bound to escape so I'll need to come up with a trap I can set to catch or kill her. Well the second part is really easily addressed. She's chained up there, shoot her in the head, job done. And the first part of that is, well, she's already captured. If you think she would escape, and she doesn't, by the way, she's rescued, which is not quite the same thing, put her somewhere she can't escape from. Put extra chains on her, put extra guards around her, because part of his plan has to be to reduce the guards prior to Leon breaking into the complex, because he says when he does that there are less guards. Randall's plan to stop her escaping is to lower the guard so that she can escape in order that she can fall into his trap. It has to be easier to increase the guards. Basically, the ending is moronic. But it's just part of writing like you're throwing concepts at the page. How many concepts can I introduce? How many will stick? Amy's first introduction shows how difficult her life is when somebody tries to rape her. She's about 10, but then that part of the story doesn't really go anywhere. She's already decided to go on the trek to Chicago before the police come for her, so it isn't any part of cause and effect. It wasn't the driving force behind anything because she believes that the voice she's hearing in her head calling her to Chicago is her lost mother. The attempted rape doesn't even make her significantly distrustful because she mentions the idea that she's unsure about getting in a van with an old man, but she gets in it anyway. She goes home with Sister Rose minutes after meeting her and then later agrees to go home and live with a man she doesn't know at all simply because he tells her he has sons who will treat her like a sister. If your attempted child rape is used so little in the story, there's a danger of being cynical. I won't go as far as exploitative because the book isn't anywhere near that grubby, but it is just an attempt to inject some pathos when in truth, Amy contributes so little, she may as well have been cut out completely. If you look at Leon's backstory, all that stuff about the space station is absolutely irrelevant to the rest of the story. It is purely a crutch with which to kill his family. But this is a society that's collapsing into a race war. So if his family were killed just because they were black, then that would function as well, if not better, for the plot and also be relevant to the themes of the plot. The space station is not. I genuinely feel it was included to be more sci-fi because if Leon's family were killed by Skinners, the finale would have added emotional weight for the character and as an author you'd have that idea running right through the story rather than merely mentioned as a concept just before occurring in the final act. If your finale is based on something you haven't really mentioned prior to it occurring then you have a problem and one concept that Burton doesn't consider at all is that as soon as Dr Reynolds uses the abilities of the neural enhancer to control somebody else's mind in order to lead them to harm even if she's the good guy and they're the bad guy it immediately makes that machine something that needs to be destroyed regardless of its current net benefit to humanity because as soon as somebody like Dr Randall Sinclair has that ability you have no way of stopping him walking every black person in America into one of his skin farms. Not only that, but Reynolds is supposed to be a good person, but she sets all Sinclair's henchmen to viciously murder each other. It's if you've seen Return of the Jedi, consider your view of Luke Skywalker if he'd rescued Han by walking into Jabba's palace and setting everybody there to uncontrollably murder one another. What is quite striking about this book is that when I read a book, sometimes I make notes, but other times I'll just fold down a page in a corner so that I know I want to come back to something or something's interesting or particularly good or particularly noteworthy. But I don't believe I've ever dogged quite as many pages as this. This is so many, in fact, that I don't believe I could possibly discuss all of the things that I wanted to. Not all of them are bad, but by far the great majority of them are things that make you go, why have you done that? Because this isn't just a book that trades on cliches, piles up concepts rather than telling a story. And ultimately, the real killer is that it's just not written very well. A minor example is that Burton doesn't know what he's doing with italics. They're used when a character's sixth sense, a side effect of the neuroenhancer, warns them of danger, quite literally. 
They're used when people are talking to themselves. They're used when Dr. Reynolds is communicating telepathically with others. And then when Leon receives the message, you'll probably get yourself killed. It could be any of the three. But what's really sad is the banality that this introduces into the text, particularly if you look at the first two examples. So much more could be done with them. The terror and panic of those situations, even the wonder that this warning is coming from something other than your normal senses. Every time he does this, it is a wasted opportunity. People who watch my videos, even semi-regularly, will probably know that I like to look at authors, metaphors and similes. And as a debut writer, Burton seriously indulges. It's a bit excessive and not always creating an effect beyond unintentional comedy. This is a good or bad example, depending on your taste. And it comes on a page that is a single page of text with no less than five similes. He lay on his back, his eyes open and glassy, like the eyes of a dead fish. Steel girders and reinforcement rods stretched across the empty spaces like twisted frozen snakes. Jagged chunks of concrete and metal that had fallen from the bridge stuck out of the water like the teeth of a hungry fish. Amy knew she would splatter like an egg if she fell on those pieces. She had taken just another step when she heard a groaning cracking noise like nails being pulled from a board. With a really strong writer, you would say that consistent metaphors, repetition of metaphors, such as the example of the fish here, would be a theme that runs through the story, it would be not just the initial metaphor, but a lasting symbolism, possibly intertextual, for example, if the fish image was being utilized for connotations with Jesus and the Feast on the Mount. You'll see this with Dickens and Shakespeare, but here I'm pretty sure that this is just ill-considered or unconsidered repetition. And the last three similes that I've listed here come in three consecutive sentences, so each sentence in turn has a simile in it. Probably the worst example of this excess, but not out of keeping with the rest of Aftermath. I haven't seen a simile as out of place as this one in a very long time. Rennie saw several large livestock buildings and a grain silo that rose above the ground like a giant penis. Yes, that's in a published book. Not Playboy's Reader's Wives, but a genuinely published book. The air was almost clean, almost, for it carried upon it the all too familiar fragrance of burning shit. Not a simile, but in a similar vein, and the novel is not really trying for a comedic tone, so as a narrator, you might not want to do that. What you could say, and have the same effect with less, is that the air was unclean. Around the same part of the book, Burton starts writing triplets. Down, down, down she went, deep within the world of swelling darkness, tumbled and tossed about like a kite in a thunderstorm. We even get a pretty naff simile thrown in for free with that one. Kick, 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 she told herself, remembering the swimming lessons she had been given at the shelter. He closed his eyes and imagined himself flying with the wind, soaring like a bird up to the sun, soaring, 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 never falling. Gone, 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 all of it gone, a world of hopes and dreams destroyed forever in a fiery blaze. And if you look at the page numbers, you can see that we get a flurry of those. And aside from multiple instances of help me, help me, help me and danger, 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 it isn't something that becomes a theme or style outside that handful of pages. There are only very isolated uses after this point. So it seems like something that got into his head was an effective literary technique. It's not. And he didn't realize he was overusing it and then perhaps stopped writing for the day, came back the next morning and forgot that he was ever doing it at all. I think this because of passages like this one. She stepped up to the metal door and placed her left ear against it, listening for sounds from the other side. The metal door felt cool against her flushed skin, like a breath of winter on a hot summer's day. What we have here is repetition of and unnecessary adjectives. We don't need metal twice. We don't need the flushed. But if you're going to use it, think about when and where an adjective does you the most good. We have yet another simile, rather cliched as well. But what is that simile doing for the reader in terms of tone? This is a scene where Dr. Reynolds is running for her life and trying to find her way out of a prison. Does a breath of winter on a hot summer's day sound rather pleasant? Because if it does, or even if it can, then don't put it here. A quality writer thinks about the consistency of tone and a scene like that should be dangerous and perilous and anything that's not helping you achieve that tone should not be in it. In the last third of the book, Burton discovers onomatopoeia and I really rather wish he hadn't. Amy, our defenceless ten-year-old girl, is alone in the woods at night, stalked by an animal. Burton writes, the sound drew closer, crackle, crackle, snap. I thought he was going to try and plug cereal. 
This would be more tolerable if it was at least a return of the triplets. Allowing for this being Amy's narration, it is still horrible and not in the way that you want when a 10 year old is being stalked by killer dogs. Luckily enough, she's rescued by a noise. It was the clackety clackety chug chug of an engine. The dogs must have heard the noise too, for they paused, frozen in place like a photograph, a painting of terror. The sound of the engine came closer. Clackety clackety chug chug. And at this point, the only sane reaction is to ask, what the fuck am I reading? Again, awful simile. Again, italics, but not used in a way that they've ever been used before in the text. Not unless you're going to claim that that's a message telepathically sent to her from Dr. Reynolds. Thirdly, this is a painting of terror, and the words that you use to convey terror are clackety clackety chug chug. You can allow a little bit for the change of style. This book is narrated in the third person, but each chapter is restricted to a single viewpoint. So you could say, well, this is being narrated in Amy's style, but really the change between the chapters are slim to none, and you still need to achieve the tone you want from the scene. What is going on here is just dog shit because it's provable repeated behavior. Dr. Reynolds is captured by the Skinners and driven towards a horrible death. Every second of that wait is described as an eternity of mind-numbing horror, every moment an endless nightmare. So bad is it that even death would not set foot in such a miserable place as that which existed in the back of the cargo truck. So Rennie was doomed to linger among the living, aware of every sway of the truck, each tiny bump of the road, and the continuous passage of time slowly, slowly, almost stopped. Tick tock, tick tock. And if you didn't know from the page number, this is the same page with the penis simile. A new high for American literature. Fuck the Pulitzer for overlooking a text of this genius. I'm going to put a picture of these two pages up because there is just so much of it I couldn't possibly read it all or even type it all out as normal. But I just want you to look at the words I've underlined and see the repetition of shadows, the safety of shadows twice. Am I getting as a writer all I can from using shadows if I say they're safe? Then we have buildings and then second building, third building, the verb we get for most of his movement is stepped, not crept or anything that might say a little bit more, it's stepped. And then this passage here where the word door is used in three consecutive sentences in four out of five and then three out of four at the end, it's ridiculous. And if you're thinking the word is door, there aren't any synonyms for it. Let's just have a look at the last one. He would kill the first man to step through the door and likely be killed by the second. He faced the door waiting for death. What do we lose if we say this instead? He would kill the first man to step through the door and likely be killed by the second. He was waiting for death. How about this? He would kill the first man to step through and likely be killed by the second. He was waiting for death. If you're going to use repetition, use it for effect. Repeating door in every other sentence, and Burton uses it more than that, it gives you nothing. It gives your reader nothing. In conclusion, I haven't really discussed the issues this book has with the world that it describes, but it is a novel of concepts rather than plot, and not all of it well thought out. For example, Dr. Reynolds is trying to save a world that in this form isn't worth saving, and I don't really see that curing skin cancer or Parkinson's is going to be possible when all the hospitals are closed, when people don't have cars or any other type of transportation to get them to hospital, where people are localised by failed infrastructure and are killing each other over scraps, where the police are at once saviour threat and described as basically non-existent, which is a perfect summary for a text which is a jumble of ideas that don't gel together. Some of the concepts on their own might have made a good book, for example Dr. Reynolds' discovery leading to an investigation of the deep state of the industrial medical complex and the corruption within would be a great political thriller. Here it's just one aside of many. Leon learning that the shuttle launches to the new space station are causing environmental damage to the Earth could lead to an astonishing thriller describing the last days of people stuck on that station and wondering if there will ever be another shuttle that could bring them supplies or rescue them. In aftermath, the concept is totally irrelevant, functioning only as a completely interchangeable backstory for one of many characters that exist on cliché and little else. That they're the best part of the book tells you as much really as you need to know. Sadly for a man who spent a lot of his time on TV telling stories to children, the writer doesn't seem to have learned how to write one. 
His style is a mixture of fads that come and go, excessive, occasionally dreadful similes, and a complete inability to create and maintain tone. The only positive thing I can say about it is that it isn't the worst book called Aftermath. That's still on you, Chuck. Thanks for watching. I bitch and whine about books almost every week, so if you suffered this far, like and subscribe for more of this sort of thing.